I'd like to welcome all of us to our 10th lecture series in our audit and assurance class. I hope that everything is okay with you today or in this moment. I want to focus on introduction to audit evidence. An introduction to audit evidence. We shall look at the nature of audit evidence. That is the description of audit evidence. We shall look at the qualities of audit evidence. We shall look at audit assertions, procedures that we undertake to gather evidence. We shall look at CATS, that is computer assisted audit techniques. We shall also consider the use of the work of others in gathering evidence. Now, we start with that question, and of course, it's very important for us to appreciate the fact that gathering audit evidence is crucial because it minimizes to some extent the risk of issuing an inappropriate audit opinion. So audit evidence refers to all the information used by the auditor in arriving at the conclusion on which the audit opinion is to be based. Audit evidence must be sufficient, that is in terms of quantity, and it should be appropriate, that is in terms of relevance and reliability in order for us to persuade our audience. Audit evidence quality really speaks to the following for audit evidence um, to be said uh, to be of a good quality uh, we should have the following so it is said that external evidence is much more reliable than internal evidence because internal evidence can be susceptible to uh, you know the attempt by auditees to conceal the reality that is on the ground, internal evidence can be manipulated in simple terms. And so external evidence is much more objective. Auditor evidence is better than that which is collected from the entity managers. Entity evidence can be relied upon if only the internal controls are effective. Written evidence is said to be more reliable <coughs> excuse me, than oral evidence. Original evidence is um, much more better, you know, originals are better than photocopies. So would like to also think about that. I would like also to add on that point, say corroborative evidence is better than evidence from one source. Now, what are some of the factors that affect the efficiency of audit? And uh, it is very important for us to remember that uh, the sufficiency rather of audit. It is very important for us to remember that uh, the issue of sufficient audit evidence depends on uh, a lot of factors and chief among them is um, the subjective perspective of the auditor uh, trying to communicate the fact that you know you will have to decide as an auditor when your evidence is sufficient nobody's going to tell you that so what enables you to decide so you look at your risk assessment result, of course, uh, presence of high risk requires us to, you know, be careful with uh, the way we collect our, you know, evidence. And the ne next we have got the nature of systems. So again, if internal control risk is high, uh, then you want to be, again, very careful the way you collect your evidence because uh, it is likely that uh, 
you're going to issue a qualified audit opinion. Materiality of an item, okay, so the importance of an item in the eyes of the user will determine what extent you're going to, you know, collaborate audit evidence. Yeah, factors that determine the sufficiency of audit evidence can also include the experience of the auditor. Okay, so from your past work experience, what you consider to be, you know, adequate audit evidence. Source and reliability of information obtained. If sources are internal, we want to corroborate internal sources of audit evidence with external sources before we can say that we have got a complete picture. Then we have got results of procedures. So if uh, analytical procedures requires you to do more work, if you have got red flags in your analysis, you want to undertake more work. So let us now proceed. Financial statements or sessions. Now, financial statements or sessions are the representation by management, explicit or otherwise, that are embodied in the financial statements. I can say here that when we are presented with financial statements, we have a draft of uh, what uh, management management rather claims to be the reality. It is our responsibility as auditors to probe further and to ask questions, okay, so that we can, you know, confirm or dismiss our concerns. There are three classes of auditor sessions, and these, there are three categories rather of auditor sessions, and these include classes of transactions and events. Here we're speaking to items that are largely found in the statement of profit or loss. We have got account balances. These are items that are largely found in the statement of financial position. We have got disclosures. So here we're referring to the notes to the financial statements. We need to know the meaning of each one of those sessions that have been indicated. Occurrence means the transaction and event recorded in the financials occurred and pertains to the entity. Completeness means all transactions, assets, liabilities, and equity interests have been recorded, and these and that all the transactions that should, be, should have been recorded, rather, have been recorded. All explanations that have been, you know, uh, that should have been given, rather, have been given. Arculus means amounts of data and other information have been recorded and disclosed appropriately. This speaks to, uh, in most cases, arithmetic accuracy. Cutoff means a transaction and event has been recorded in the correct accounting period. Classification and understandability refers to transactions and events that have been recorded in the proper accounts and described and disclosed in a clear way. Existence. Existence means assets, liabilities, and equity interests do exist. No, it's not just a matter of claiming, but we have this. Rights and obligation. The entity holds or controls the rights to assets and liabilities. Are the obligations of the entity. Valuation and allocation means uh, assets, liabilities, and equity interests are included within the financial statements at appropriate values. All right. So, sources of audit evidence, we get on there. How do you gain your evidence? I think from what we discussed when we did introduction to internal controls. We can obtain evidence by simply observing the effectiveness of internal controls, that is indirect evidence. Or where internal controls are weak, or are judged to be ineffective, or non-existent at all, substantive audit procedures can be, you know, included, or employed rather. Uh, this include tests of detail, means to prove further in order to get evidence are relating to an account balance. Analytical procedures simply means comparisons of, you know, 
different sources of you know audit evidence for browsability. It includes the comparison of year on year sales or quarterly sales, sales which relate to a particular quarter, see if uh, there has been any drastic changes. So what are some of the techniques that you can employ as an auditor to gather, you know, audit evidence? You can do what we call physical inspection of tangible assets. So you inspect, let's say, motor vehicles for existence. You can do inspection of documentation or records. You can inspect, let's say, title of, let's say, property for rights and obligations. You can make observations of internal controls in action. You can make inquiries of management where you need to get more collaborative evidence. You can make confirmation of account balances um, with suppliers and customers. You can also use the solicitor of your clients to get more confirmation relating to legal matters. You can recalculate. That is, uh, recasting, for instance, the uh, asset register to find out if the total on the register is equal to what has been put there. You can perform, you know, um, you can perform, you can, you can perform a task such as bank reconciliation to check whether a particular bank reconciliation on a particular account was done appropriately. Or you can undertake what is known as analytical procedures, that is, uh, the compare comparison rather of like to like or like for like items, to check whether there is plausible relationship between between what you're comparing and any you know um, any deviations, you know, drastic or significant deviation, calls for further investigations. All right, now. Under audit sampling, we must concede that uh, it's very important for us to appreciate the fact that auditors do not, um, you know, examine transaction for transaction, that is, examining the entire transaction list or catalog of their clients. For that would be prohibitively expensive. So they employ what we call sampling. And audit sampling in our case means the application of audit procedures to less than 100% of items within a population of audit relevance so that all sampling units have a chance of selection in order to provide the auditor with reasonable basis on which to draw a conclusion about the qualities and the attributes of the entire sample. Now it is important when sampling to be careful when sampling, the auditor must choose what is known as a representative sample. And here, the higher the sample, the lower the sampling risk. We shall deal with that very soon. If a sample is representative, the same conclusion will be drawn from that sample as would have been drawn had the whole population been tested. For a sample to be representative, it should have the same characteristics as that of the entire population. I think this requires experience in order for us to arrive at a meaningful conclusion. There are two types of sampling methods. We have got what we call statistical sampling. In this approach, sampling uses modern selection samples and probability theory. Okay, sampling uses probability theory here to evaluate sample results. Any approach that does not have both these characteristics is considered to be non-statistical sampling. Okay, it is random. Again, the approach taken under sampling is a matter of the judgment of a given auditor. When designing a sample, the auditor has to consider the following uh, because this is going to, you know, uh, cascade or you know, determine how you're going to interpret your sample results. You need to know the purpose of the procedure. You need to have a combination of procedures being performed so that you counter check uh, your sample size. You need to have 
the nature of you need to have in mind rather the nature of evidence that you're seeking all right you need also to look out for possible misstatement conditions because um you have to stay many things for you to make uh, a conclusion on a given sample so uh if the account the accounting system of your client is not um perfect then we must factor in potential you know um potential issues that would undermine the conclusions that we make on a given sample sampling methods in detail we have what we call random selection this can be achieved through the use of random number generators or tables auditors would like to use this method if they want to you know improve what we call unpredictability um, level in their auditing so that you see there is uh, a fair chance of you know touching uh, as many variables within a sample uh, within a, the entire population actually uh, random selection okay so here you're trying to avoid bias in terms of sampling okay then we have good what we call systematic selection where a constant sampling interval is used e.g you can select the 15th balance and the first item is selected of course randomly monetary unit selection is common most auditors would rather you know sample for the highest amounts or the lowest amounts okay so that they can see where the procedure was followed remember these might uh, be unusual transactions and uh, they may require further audit investigation haphazard selection is very close to you know random sampling auditor does not follow a structured technique but avoids bias or predictability block selection this involves selection or selecting a block of continuous okay items from the population this technique can be used for establish what we call cutoff okay whether a transaction was recorded in the correct account period sampling risk and stratification now sampling risk is a reality it arises from the possibility that uh, the auditor's conclusion based on a sample may be different from the conclusion that would be reached if the entire population was examined uh, using the same procedures all right now here we say if you're going to minimize sampling risk you need to increase the size of your sample all right and also you need to come with some knowledge and experience on how to interpret the results from a sample stratification or stratification is a process of breaking down a population into smaller subpopulation so that you can further examine these subpopulations on their own so that you can be a little bit more accurate in your interpretation of your sample two broad categories of cuts well now let's get on to cuts and uh, cuts again simply means computer assisted audit techniques under here we've got test of data and audit software this is a place where we have got uh, an interface of accounting and IT knowledge test of data means or involves the auditor submitting dummy data into the client system sure that the system correctly processes it and that it prevents or detects and corrects misstatements for instance if uh, accounts assistants are not supposed to post transactions we can, the auditor can ask them to post transaction and to see whether the system is going to reject their posting because if there's only few individuals who are allowed to do that then the system must reject what the you know trainee auditors are doing at the trainee uh, trainee accountants rather are doing what are the pros and cons of test data so number one test data enables the auditor to test programmed controls which wouldn't be otherwise tested and then we also have once designed costing card will be minimal unless the program controls a change requiring the test data to be redesigned now this is on the part of the auditor the cost of doing the testing might be less as long as the client system is not changed demerits under test of data what are some of the demerits that we have let me just uh, 
take that one there so that uh, I can have my heading there right here continued okay so let's great let's get on to it um, what are some of the disadvantages there's a risk of corrupting the client system especially when you are not very much familiar with how to use um, test data and this uh, test data requires time to be spent in the client system if used in a live mode otherwise you're going to crash system of your client and they may sue you again okay a place where we could also have good findings as auditors is the area where managers use estimates an accounting estimate is an approximation of a monetary amount in the absence of a precise means of measurement for example the allowance to reduce inventory receivables to the estimated realizable value you have got depreciation accrued revenue and so on and so forth the auditor must question the estimates of management. You should consider reasonableness of the assumptions made when coming up with estimates by managers. You should consider if management has considered alternative assumptions. You should also evaluate whether estimates are reasonable or misstated, based on your experience, of course. And you should obtain evidence about accuracy of the disclosures made about the estimates. Using the work of others is very common in audit. Avoid, of course, duplication of work. For instance, using the work of internal auditors provides guidance in this area. The external auditor's objective here is to determine whether the work of internal auditors can be used, and if so, in which areas, so that we can minimize duplication of effort. To determine whether the work is adequate for the audit. Now, you need to be very careful because... Um, some of these uh, you know experts we want whose works we want to use may not be you know comp competent okay if the auditor decides to make use of the work of internal audit they must evaluate that work the important criteria when determining whether the work of the internal audit function is to be used is you need to assess the extent to which internal audit work is you know objectively uh, the extent rather to which its objectivity is supported okay so objectivity is very much associated with uh, independence uh, if the auditors are not in the, the internal auditors are not independent of managers in terms of their work as well as reporting lines then we may not place much reliance on their work level of competence must also be assessed here and whether approach of the internal auditors is systematic and disciplined. Do the internal auditors document their work? We need to ask ourselves those questions. And is, are their findings respected? If the answer to all these questions is no, then we place less reliance on the work of internal auditors. Okay, the use of an expert's work. An auditor's expert is an individual organization possessing expertise in a field other than accounting or auditing. These might be uh, actuaries uh, or individuals who are able to do complex works um, that is outside the scope or knowledge of you know, our profession as accountants. Using the work of an auditor's expert requires the auditor to agree the following with the experts on the following because you see, um, we cannot delegate audit opinion responsibility to anybody. So you need to look at the nature, scope, and objective of the work of your expert. You need to uh, also check the respective roles and responsibility of that expert. Make sure that these are fulfilled. You need to look at the nature and extent of communication between yourselves and your experts, including the form of report that they're supposed to submit to you. That you're going to use as part of your audit evidence you need also to um, ensure that it is agreed between yourselves and your experts that confidentiality shall be honored all right yeah now i want to finish with service organization a service organization is a third party organization that provides services to user entities that are part of those entities information systems relevant to financial reporting a service organization is very much close to what we call management experts 
But in this case, perhaps we can give an example where, for instance, a company has outsourced its payroll function to another company, its payroll, you know, task to another company. Then that company that prepares the payroll for that company is a service organization. Now, we may need to rehearse with this service organization when obtaining evidence. We need to know as auditors, under our consideration, we need to know how the use of a service organization affects the entity's internal control. We need to know the nature and materiality transactions that were processed, materiality of transactions rather that were processed by the service organization. We need to establish the degree of interaction between our clients and uh, the service of organization. And then lastly, we need to know the nature of relationship between the client and the service organization because if they have related part relationship, it is possible that uh, there could be an aspect of, you know, preferential charges. I'd like to thank you for listening to this lecture. And I want you to ask questions uh, wherever there's that, uh, you know, need or possibility. Let me hear from you. Thank you very much for listening.